I'm not sure what Tim's doing. Is Tim working entirely without our lecture slides? Yeah. Is he? Good, good, okay. Well, we're going to cheat. So I've stripped out the words. We've just got pictures. Who's that? And what's she in? Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, what's she in? In a car, isn't she? But what sort of car is it? A British car. A British car. Yeah. Does anyone know what sort of British car it is? It's a very good. Okay, the great folk of the 1980 motor show. So who's that? Can we see that? Well, it's just a muddy face, really, isn't it? I'll have to tell you. Anyway, Steve McQueen, and what's he on? He's on a British motorbike. And roughly, when is it? So the, the last picture was 1980 Motor Show. So what about that? Haircuts, suit. He's in Britain. Steve McQueen's in Britain at the Isle of Man. And this is the Mandarin section of the, of the Isle of Man TT. 1950s? A little bit later. Uh, 60s. It's, it's the mid-60s. It's about 1964 when BSA... I think BSA had just disposed of Dane the cars, but BSA also still owns Triumph motorcycles, which is what he's sitting on, and they're just called McKinsey's in, but they had also just recorded their largest single export boom to a key market, 40% boost in exports to the US. And there is, you know, he's the equivalent of Brad Pitt, and he's riding a Triumph, okay? And who's that? And what's he on? And when was it? <laughs> it's Mick Jagger, thank you. What's your name? Ed. Ed, thank you, Ed. And what's he on? We can read it, can't we? He's on a Honda. And when do you think this picture was taken? So this picture was mid 1960s, 1964, actually, the year that McKinsey's came in to BSA Triumph to sort them out. And McKinsey may or may not have come up with the right advice. But anyway, but like a decade later, what had happened between that and that? Well, big stars like Mick Jagger and the 1960s equivalent of Brad Pitt were no longer riding British motorcycles. Maybe they are now. Maybe if you saw a picture of Brad Pitt on a motorbike, he would be riding a triumph. But that's something else and something maybe we'll get to. Okay, so motorcycles. We are doing the British motor industry and motorcycles are a part of. So I will be talking, there will be slides and there will be some graphs. We have to, when we look at data, we have to work out what the data is, yeah? So some of the data is going to be vehicles, some of it's going to be cars, and thing, big exports in the 1960s were motorcycles, they, were, they weren't they were cars so much then, earlier they had been, but they were also commercial vehicles. So sometimes when we're looking at some of these motor industry statistics, it also includes commercial vehicles. Commercial vehicles now we almost produce none. I believe we produce transit vans in Southampton or somewhere, yeah? But we don't do much else. Anyway, the lecture's in five parts, and hopefully, if we finish in time, we will watch a little bit of Top Gear, okay? So that's an incentive for me to, to rush. I, I, will, I have a confession to make, so don't stop me if you've heard this one before, but slow me down, because I did have sleep, and I woke myself up with a red bull, so if anyone's seen uh, train spotting and Spud going for an interview, I might become a little bit like that. Anyway, so slow me down if I'm going too fast. Uh, but I do want to get to the Top Gear episode because there is a reason for it. Okay, so we're going to do facts about the industry, why the industry is important, okay? And then we're going to look at the industry over time. And then we're going to look at the nature of motor manufacturing and firms in the industry. And then we're going to, then we're going to come back to Margaret Thatcher in a British Leyland Metro. Uh, with a, an A-series engine, okay, who went out of production only relatively recently, well, 10, 10 or so years ago. Strangely, we might even talk about Alec Izigonis, but uh, we'll maybe leave him for now. So, facts about the industry. Why is the industry so important? This is, again, around that period, there is a relationship, or there was a relationship, between this guy and this girl. Anyway, so mid-60s, uh, output's important. It's important. So the industry is important for output, employment, and balance of payments. So in 1963, the industry accounted for <coughs> over 5% of industrial production. Indirect, indirectly, another 6% of production. And so around the time this picture was taken, it accounted for 30% of industrial growth. 
Yeah. So it was, it was an important industry. By 1974, this isn't 1974, does anyone know what that is? It's a Belgian concept of GSC. It's a Belgian concept. It looks a bit like it, doesn't it? Um, but it's not. It's, uh, it's a similar car. You know what I was going to do, but we don't have time for this. I was going to divide you up into male and female. There are going to be points for when we see which team won uh, for getting the right car. Now, I don't know what car. I think this is a Jaguar. And it isn't a Jaguar. If they think it isn't a Jaguar, I, I thought it was a Jaguar. And I thought it was made in the same produ production plan that we'll see later on another slide. Anyway, so it's in, this isn't 1974, and neither is this 1974. But this is Longbridge. That isn't Longbridge. That's the Jaguar plant. The Jaguar used to be part of uh, British Lane for a while, and before that, part of British Motor Company. But the point is, in 1974, it, was, it, it accounted for a quarter of a million people directly employed in the motor industry. The supply industry has accounted for uh, 300,000. Sales and repairs, another 400,000. So total employment, nearly, nearly 1.3 million. And then we've got sort of auxiliary service, services of haulage, petrol, insurance companies, taxis, buses, all transport related, all, all indirectly related to motor cars, motor vehicles, I should say. Important in terms of balance of payments, yes, in 1977. In 1977, which to me doesn't seem that long ago, but to you maybe it does. 1977 was the year of punk rock. It was also the year that we stopped being a net, a net exporter of vehicles. Is there a link between that? Accounted, anyway, accounted for 10% of exports until then, so between 1952 and 19, uh, 1977. Before that, between 1945 and 1952, we'll get, we'll get into this, it accounted for much more. Okay, because the motor industry hit the ground running after the Second World War, despite appearances. Okay, so section two, the industry over time. Okay, so pre-1914, Britain lags behind the US and Europe in terms of vehicle production. But everywhere, cars are just a plaything for the rich. Even Ford, in 1910, only produced 10,000 Model T Fords. But by 1912, Highland Park had been constructed. Once Highland Park got into production, it was producing vast numbers. So in 1914, it produced a quarter of a million cars. Motors became a common sight in Britain by the interwar period. They were in all towns, but they weren't everywhere in towns, OK? This picture down here, I can't really work it out, but it's the old bridge. In the interwar period, okay, so there's motor vehicles. This is why we have, we have to have motorcycles. Has anyone seen that gap minder thing where the guy talks about um, economic development, yeah? Gap minder, economic development using IKEA cartons. Has anyone seen that? No one's seen that, I can't believe it. It's a bit, you, you've seen that. Okay, so you, the aspiration is bicycle, motorcycle, car, yeah? And then aeroplane. Then we, we, you know, we live in congested cities. There's, there's congestion charges. There's no other part of it. So we, you know, we fly everywhere. But okay, interwar period. There's a range of motor vehicles. Most of them parked in the old bridge are taxis. And then there's motorcycles and strange three-wheeled vehicles. So there are motor vehicles, but not everywhere in Britain. Now I, I want some help here because I'm not going to do all this reading stuff. I want a student to read the, the, the quote marks. Okay, so who's going to read me what William Morris said in 1924 about cars? This is this car here is a standard eight or something. Can anyone see what it is? Well, I did roughly try and calculate, and index numbers are tricky, as we all know. We've done enough economics to know that, and there are various calculations you could do to uh, to work out what I think 350 pounds <coughs> in modern modern terms. And this is, this is what this Scottish country house family are in and around in the interval period. Um, anyway, it's basically a Carrera 4 turbo. Okay? That's what I worked it out as now. So, you know, not everyone here can afford a Carrera 4 turbo. They can afford to drive one, whatever it is. Uh, so, anyway, so what did William Morris say? Carl. So I know a few people's names, unfortunately, and I'm going to get some pictures of a few more people so I don't just have to pick on Carl, because that would be a shame, because Carl would get a sore throat away from me. Okay, so Carl, you're going to read that, what William Morris said, please. Uh, 
uh, until the warfare goes to his factory by car, I shall not believe that we've touched more than the fringe of the home market. Okay, so 19, 1924 is a plaything of the rich. In terms of supply, Britain's doing pretty well. So Britain's, Britain's ahead of everywhere else other than the US in terms of output of cars, and ahead of Germany. Strange. Okay, so we, took, we kind of think first industrial revolution, then we think second industrial revolution. Mm, all, I couldn't say almost everyone else leaves across Britain, but, but Germany and America do. Uh, well, America clearly has some vehicle production, but, but not Germany, not at this stage. And Britain's a good place to build cars. We don't tend to think of that, do we? But maybe we should change how we think. Uh, historically, Britain was considered a good place to build cars because Henry Ford decides to site Dagenham here. So, and that was built in the late 1920s. Okay, it came into production just as <coughs> the global economy collapsed. We know all about global economies collapsing, don't we? And what that does to vehicle production, don't we? Because they all, all go cap in hand. Well, recently, they all went cap in hand to the government, didn't they? And on the note of Dagenham, has anyone seen maybe in Dagenham? One, one person, or maybe just for very shy, because I might need to read some stuff out. Okay, anyway, this is Dagenham in the 1930s. It doesn't look like Highland Park, because despite having the production for potential for 200,000 units per year, cars per year, more than total output from Germany, it didn't really kick off until the Second World War, when it started building other things, then after the Second World War. But we still have this massive trade circuit in terms of vehicle exports. If only things look like that now, eh? And if, you, if you've looked, it's very difficult to get very up-to-date vehicle statistics. Okay, So I apologise. Mine finished about 2005, I think. I wanted to see what happens. Obviously, 2007, 2008, <coughs> things change, yeah? Um, Swindon. What happens in Swindon? Does anyone know what happens in Swindon? And in the factory it closed. Yes, the factory got closed. And what factory was that? I can't you can't remember. Can anyone remember what factory is in Swindon? No, no. Um, anyone, anyone else? What car factory might be in Swindon? Um, no, does, does Rover exist? Not anymore. Not anymore, no. Or it, is, it, it, it exists by the name of MG in China, doesn't it? Anyone else? It's Honda anyway. So Honda sent its workers home on full power um, and closed the factory for a while. Oh, we do, and I'll get to that if we have time, if we get to watch a little Top Gear clip, I'll get to that. We do a factory visit here, a car factory visit, and we were trying to organise a factory visit at, at the time in 2008, and the only factory that would take us was Lotus. Has anyone heard of Lotus? Yeah, okay. So Lotus are a small, and, and to a certain extent that's all Britain has left, isn't it? Small niche market producers like Lotus, except Lotus isn't British. Who owns Lotus? The Malaysians, yeah, what car company is it? Proton. Proton, yeah, very good. Okay, so back to the 1930s, into war period, and we can see, yes, Britain's doing better than, Britain looks good, Britain's doing better than Germany, but there is America. Okay, and America just dwarfs uh, European car production, yeah? That's because of, and we'll get to that in a minute, the nature of car production. Things change a little, but not that much. It's still very difficult to make profits in volume production unless you have massive economies of scale. Okay, so, so Britain's ahead of Europe, but way behind the US, partly because of the nature of the US <coughs> in the interwar period. It's richer and it's bigger, and a lot of people don't live in cities. You don't need a car. Who has a car? Who lives in London, for a start? So most of you, and everyone else is shy. Who has a car in London? So some of you have cars. <coughs> you live in central London, do you? Or do you live in Hounslow or Hampstead or Hampstead's probably central London or Richmond or somewhere, somewhere way out, you know, where you can park the car without getting it lifted? You live in central London. I don't drive in town though. You don't drive in town, it's parked somewhere, isn't it? It is. It's on, on, on the road? Yeah. Okay, but, um, so you pay for a, a parking permit. Yeah, it's okay. cheaper. It's cheaper? Okay. Well, we won't ask for the phone Okay, so we Second World War, and this is key. <coughs> So car plants are used for armaments production. And this is a Morris factory making spitfires. <coughs> this Morris factory, you can, you can kind of read it. This Morris factory, factory makes Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. 
Rolls-Royce Packard Merlin engines, so there's a licensing deal, and Lancasters and also Spitfires, and peak production was 300 Spitfires a month. The important thing to remember here, though, is shadow factories. Does anyone know what shadow factories are? Ed, so much. Someone else? Yeah. Yes. Where are you going? Um, shadow factories are factories that supply parts to the original, first, uh, the primary factories. Um, not really. I mean, in, in, our, in the run-up to war, we built these factories that didn't do anything. But just in case, okay, they would be ready to come online. Ed? Yeah, there were factories built by the government, but run by private firms to add extra capacity in order to build things like Spitfires, the classic rubbish, the very famous. It's a classic one. And that, that goes back to this picture here, I hope. But, you know, I just download these pictures, and I don't know what they are. Ah, this one. Uh, I, th I hoped that was the same factory as the Spitfire factory. Okay, the Spitfire factory was, was, was newly created as a shadow factory, and after the war it made Jaguars. And I think they still make Jaguars there, but Ed might be right, it could be a Bentley. Um, but it looks a bit like a Jaguar. Okay, so where are we? Back to Spitfires. Now, the, the amazing thing about Spitfire is not Spitfire. British people tend to think you know, they won the war, the Battle of Britain, and all this. They were pretty rubbish, as you probably know. It took something like eight man hours to change the oil, and it took one man hour to change the oil in Measure Smith 109. It had eight minutes of armament capacity, ordnance capacity, so it could, it could fire for eight minutes. And Measure Smith 109 could fire for 45 minutes or something, a long time. It had carburetors, whereas Measure Smith 109 had, had fuel injectors. <coughs> Uh, which means that when you're flying upside down or very, very steep, you're still getting fuel. The engine doesn't cut out. Because in a carburetor, there's float, and it mixes air and fuel, which goes into the chamber, and then it, there's a spark plug, and it ignites it. But without that, you're not going anywhere. And if you break down in a car, well, you've got to walk home. If you break down in an aeroplane, it's a long way down. So, but the, the, the important thing was, these shadow factories were churning them out. No or very few squadrons, fighter squadrons, went, they would lose something like 40% of the planes every day. And every day, they were replaced. And that was the key to these shadow factories, whereas the Luftwaffe weren't replacing. They, they lost less, possibly proportionately, early on, but they just couldn't replace them quick enough. Okay, so shadow factories, okay. So here is, they're not called shadow factories in the States, but here is, I think it's a Ford factory making B-24s. So these what were car factories were changed over to air, aircraft factories, and after the war, they go back to making cars again, okay? So this, I think, and I might be wrong, this is Longbridge, but you can still see the camouflage. And the critical thing is, after the war, is we in Europe, but, and we particularly in Britain, are broke. And Europe has nothing, and if you want anything, only America's producing it, okay? So these big factories in America that are producing. Because the other thing was uh, ship production. America innovated mass-produced ships that had never been done, all the same. So any, anyway, if Europe wanted anything, it needed dollars, okay? So car production, these, these I, I think, are Austin Cambridges, and they were going for export, strange enough, to America as a second car. Yeah, for you know, the big car, daddy drives the big car, mummy drives a small car, mummy drives the, the relatively small European Austin Cambridge. And this is about 1946-47, when to get steel, you need to export initially 50% of production just to get steel from, to get a kind of rationed steel coupon, if you like. By 1947-ish, you needed to export 70% of production to get steel, hence the Land Rover. Why do I say, because the Land Rover was developed about then. Uh, why do I say hence the Land Rover? Anyone know? Because the Land Rover is made out of aluminium. And all these factories that were making aeroplanes out of aluminium, suddenly, 1945 comes, we don't need to produce 300 Spitfires a month. We don't need to produce 150 Lancasters a month or thousands and thousands of B-24s a month. Okay, so aluminium is not rationed, but steel is. So the Land Rover was an innovation, it's mostly aluminium. And we will come across Ala Isagonis, we'll come across the Land Rover, the Mini, and the few successful British cars, okay? Uh, one of them that was an export success, but probably wasn't such a good car, was the Austin Cambridge. Okay, and at this time, <coughs> it fluctuates a bit, but the US is the biggest market. 
So we, we saw there the Steve McQueen picture with the motorcycles in the 1960s. In the 1940s and 1950s, the US was a significant market for the UK cars. The US and Commonwealth countries. But the US is more of a car economy. We're going to jump a huge jump now. By 1984, this big market that we're talking about, the US, how many cars do you think British Leyland, which accounted for pretty much all of UK volume production at that stage, how many cars do you think they exported to the US? This is a statistic I think I got from the top here. I have checked it out, I think it's true. So you might have heard this one. Does anyone know? Zero. Evan says zero. Evan is surprisingly close. It was one car. <laughs> I don't know what the car was. Okay, but in terms of <coughs> underneath here is a chart. I just like this picture because this picture was taken when Volkswagen in Wolfsburg was still run by a British Army Major. Okay, this picture was taken in 1946. Uh, in this period, with British export success, British imports were mostly Volkswagen. We were, in, we were exporting hundreds of thousands of cars and importing 5,000, most of them were Volkswagens. Volkswagen was, of course, offered to British car manufacturers, and uh, Billy Roots, the, uh, one, of the, one of the owners of Roots Company, who owned Hillman and Riley, and various other companies that we'll come across later, was offered uh, Volkswagen, and he declined. And that was maybe not such a smart move. But anyway, something goes wrong. We still try and export, but we're not so successful. More recently, fewer than one in five cars sold in the UK, so that's 2004, were produced in the UK. But exports were also up. So we're looking at quite a sad story here. But later on, we'll get to another. If you look here, exports. Exports were higher in 2005 than they've ever been, exports of, of vehicles from the UK, okay? But the other side of the equation is imports, okay? So the ratio of imports to exports is not looking quite so good. Okay, so more recently, I don't have time to waffle, possibly. Okay, so this is the, this, we, we, we're skipping way up into Rover BMW, or BMW owned Rover, and, and, and also the Phoenix group. Has anyone, has anyone heard of the Phoenix, Phoenix 4? They're really the Phoenix 5, aren't they? So you've heard of Phoenix 4 for a pound. They bought Rover for 10 pounds, possibly. Okay. They could be a pound, I could be wrong. Yeah, excellent, yeah. Okay, so they, they ran it for a short time. This car here, I don't know if you can read that, it says, last one on the line. Okay, and that line stopped because the uh, component supplier making bumpers just lost faith in... By then, BL was called... BL had gone through various names, Austin Rover, uh, Rover Group, and then NG Rover. Uh, it was then called NG Rover, and the component suppliers had lost... They, they didn't think they were going to get paid if they carried on supplying cars. So the bumper, the supply of bumpers for the uh, Rover 75 range just stopped supplying. And because the bumpers cannot be retrofitted, the whole line stopped. There's some very sad pictures of all these cars that are nearly finished for want of a bumper that just stopped. They're, and this, on, on here, people are signing their names, you know, they worked here. You can't see it very well, but they've worked for many, many years, and this is the last one on the line. And this is a, a Chinese variant of the Rover 75. Okay, so the export story looks good, but the import story looks <coughs> less good. The kind of things I want you to think about throughout all of this is, I guess questions like, does ownership matter? And by ownership, I suppose I mean public-private ownership, okay? Because we go through that, we go through that with the car industry and the motorcycle industry, but also, National ownership, I suppose. I mean, during this whole period, Ford and General Motors, General Motors as in Vauxhall, do a lot better than the British owned companies. And then we have the Germans, so that's not such a success story, or is it? BMW actually leave, probably quits in, you know, with the mini production plant in Cowley, just, just outside Oxford, and with uh, Land Rover Technology in various variants of the X5, is it, the four-wheel drive BMW, you probably know this more than me. I can tell you about Austin Cambridge's from 1946, you tell me about modern vehicles. The X5 and the MX3, possibly, anyway, four-wheel drive technology, they've done possibly very nicely, and they managed to sell Land Rover to Ford 
for almost as much as they bought Rover Group initially. So they, yes, they did plow money in, they lost money, but to develop a new range of product and a, a, co and a profitable small car, which they've done with the, with the Mini, is, is, is an expensive business, a very expensive business, and probably would have cost them what they spent on Rover Group. And then we've got the Japanese, by the way, the end of their story. So does ownership matter? Okay, so the nature, now the nature of car making, okay? We're not going to be dealing with too much of that um, at this stage anyway. But I'm going to get Evan now, because I know Evan's name, and he introduced himself to me, and he's wishing he hadn't. So you can read this. Um, the way to build automobiles is to make one automobile like another automobile, to make them all alike, to make them come to the factory just alike, just as one pin is like another pin when it comes from the pin factory, or one match is like another match when it comes from the match factory. There's another screen as well. Uh, you need not fear about the market. The people will buy them all right. When you get to make the cars in quantity, you can make them cheaper. When you make them cheaper, you get, can get people with enough money to buy them. The market will take care of itself. Henry Ford. Very good. Thanks. So have things changed very much from that? We'll think about that as we, as we go forward. There's a strange story about after Ali Isigonis designed the Mini and they put it into production, Ford bought one, took it apart, and costed every component, and realized that they couldn't make it for the money that's being sold there. And so they came up with mini cars, mini profits. Rover Group and BL before them, and BMC before that, and Morris and Austin before that, never really got to the stage of scale economy for the volume car. At least nothing that wasn't big. Okay, so with small cars, you need to produce an awful lot of them to make a profit. If you, I think this is in the, the lecture slides, if you're interested in, it, the, the, um, the narrative is a bit, uh, to my ears anyway, a bit condescending, but the images are amazing. So have a look at that. That's the Model T production line almost at the end of Model T's production. And it's just very interesting to look at what was a state-of-the-art car factory, and just to see how archaic it was, but also to see how mundane the work was. And this was a big problem. This, this is a, the technology, as we know from EH 101, the technology came from disassembly, didn't it? Who can explain that for me? So this is an assembly line, but the technology came from disassembly. Has anyone, did, did, has anyone done the EH101? <coughs> what, I know you, what's your name? Jeff. Jeff, of course I know you, we've emailed each other today, haven't we? Yeah, Hi Jeff, Jeff. So Jeff, explain. Was it this, this assembly of a pit? It was, absolutely. It was um, uh, abattoirs. What are abattoirs called in America? Slaughterhouses, absolutely. Slaughterhouses, meat packing. Okay, so that's, that's where some of this technology came from, yeah? This production line technology. So, Assembly lines came from disassembly lines. Okay, and, and it was almost like working in an abattoir. It was alienating, yeah? So Ford need to, needed to em employ 125 people to fill every 100 vacancies. And 85% 80, so of jobs could be learned in two weeks, okay? So you're here for three years. You'll probably do a master's after that, okay? But these guys are learning, learning the job in two weeks. Nearly half of all jobs could be learned in one day. One day. Specialised machinery. Okay, so that's, that is the mini plant in Cali. When you're looking at minimum efficient scales, you're looking at it in terms of the model. Yeah, so Model T Ford. Any colour, as long as it's black. You're looking at it in terms of the plant. And you're looking at it in terms of, in terms of plant, we mean specialised machinery and the, the fixed capital. And in terms of the company level, yeah, so model level design, expensive things, yeah, and the main components, plant level, the paint shops, the conveyor belts, company level, common parts, common parts, but also the hierarchy, the infrastructure, the management infrastructure. This, we start getting into the nitty gritty of, if you like, where some of the British producers went wrong. Don't Particularly once we get into the modern era, though, so don't overestimate the 
size needed for economies of scale. Okay? What have we got here? Does anyone know? We've got a shady picture of it. It's a Tesla and a Lotus Elise. It's a Tesla and a Lotus Elise. Why are they together? Well, the Tesla's are actually um, The Tesla's are <coughs> Can everyone hear Ed at the back? Speak louder, Ed. Okay, so the Tesla's are that trick. Um, but it's very similar car to Lotus Elise. In fact, it might be used some Lotus parts. But obviously, they're both lightweight two seat sports cars, basically. Um, the Lotus Elise is the classic one with a petrol engine. I'm listening. An American newcomer with an electric engine. I'm listening. I wanted to get a couple of books, so I'll bring my books with me. Um, um, yeah, absolutely right. Well, the Tesla, other than its batteries and its motor, is actually made on the Lotus assembly line. Okay, so that's another way of getting economies of scale. And the Lotus Elise has a Toyota Celica engine in. The Lotus Evora has a Toyota Camry V6 married to a Toyota of Avora possibly gearbox, okay? Because the Camry is for the American market, it's only produced in automatic form, and for a sports car you need a manual gearbox. Um, so you can get economies of scale by using other people's components in a kind of globalized factory level. So don't overstate that. But going back to our economies of scale, our minimum efficient scale in terms of model plant and company, think about that in terms of British volume production, okay? We'll come back to that. The, the importance of the industry is to do these forward and backward linkages. That's kind of the wrong way around because that's a backward linkage and these are forward linkages. Has anyone come across these expressions, forward and backward linkages? This is kind of development economics, isn't it? So if you have a power industry, it kicks up the steel industry. So our steel industry, which used to be called Chorus, used to be called Bridge Steel, is now owned by who? You'll come in, you'll do this at some point. Everyone's got their Jeffrey Owen, yeah? Who, who's not got a <coughs> Jeffrey Owen? Okay, you will, you, sh you should get Jeffrey Owen. Mine cost me 63p and nearly three pounds in package and post -age. You should get your Jeffrey Owen. Jeffrey Owen is almost like a textbook for this course, but you will pass with a Jeffrey Owen from coming to lectures and going to classes and contributing but you, you won't do that well, okay, you'll pass. You need to do more if you want to get a good grade, okay? You need to read other books, I've got a range of other books. Okay, so we've got Roy Church. Roy Church is a little bit dated, one sort of more modern. We've got up to Phoenix 4, various other books. We'll talk about those in a minute. But, okay, we'll get to steel industry. So who, who owns British Steel now? Tata. Tata, yes. And who, what car companies do they own now? Well, they own Jaguar. They own Jaguar. Uh, they, 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 they do own Jaguar and Land Rover now, yeah. Okay, so Luke, is that you over there, Luke? Luke? You're not Luke. Okay, you're someone who looks like Luke. Um, okay, so someone else can read this for me. I, I'm running out of people whose names I know. Rasha, I know your name. So, can you read that? Big loud voice, it's not much to read. Um, in the language of development, no other product to yield this very good, thanks. So, it's, it's seen as key to developing and maintaining a manufacturing sector, an industrial sector, really, which, is, which partly explains some of the things that go so badly wrong with it. Partly explains why Obama issues out all this money, not very long ago, to Detroit. Does it make sense? So, section four. We have a wild card here, and I think you'll spot it when we, when we hit it, okay? So in, uh, in the early period, so pre-First World War, we had a <coughs> proliferation of lots of little firms in the back of garages and stables. 198 firms were producing at least one car in 1930 in Britain, okay? There were many others that were called, or called themselves car producers. They didn't actually produce a car, but um, there was just a lot of small producers. And again, think about this in the context of what goes wrong with British motor manufacturing. And almost, this is kind of all we've got left, yeah? But it almost looks like a Morgan underneath. And these were cars, a bit like Morgan, made to order, okay? So the economies of scale don't matter. This is the shaft keeper idea, the British shaft keeper. Absolutely, yeah, it is. Uh, it's also related to craft skills. And th this comes into play as well in terms of labour disputes, okay, and job differentiation. 
Some of the things have become almost laughable in the 1970s. You know, some of them have their roots here, back, back in craft industries. And when we look at this, these are all 1906 cars. Okay, they look quite different. That is a Rolls Royce. That is Herbert Austin in his first car, okay? in, in the first Austin. They don't look that different. This is a Rover. I think, oh, is that 1904? So they're all around the same period. And this is early 1900, 1904, 1906. And you can see that this is just coachable. And it even looks like a coach, doesn't it? Uh, so it is down to craft skills and craft manufacturing and almost manufacturing to order. But by the interval period, there is this shakeout where suddenly economies of scale come into their own. And you cannot be a craft producer unless you're at the top of the market, unless you are Bristol Motors. You should go onto Bristol Motors' website, who still exist, who made aeroplanes during the Second World War, and just look at their website. I think the cheapest car they produce is about £170,000. And they produce them to order, and they, and they don't care. But how many units do they produce? Maybe they make a profit. I don't know. Maybe they, they don't need to make a profit. But it's not volume manufacturing anymore. And it is still produced in Bristol. OK, so the shakeout. Dramatic decline in, in the number of companies producing cars in the interwar period. Okay, we end up in 1939, the beginning of the Second World War, with essentially six producers: Morris, Austin. We we know most of the names. Do we know most of the names? Is this a generational thing? I know the names. <coughs> um, so Morris, Austin, Standard, Ford, Roots. Okay, but by by the mid to, mid 1960s, this is actually BMC. This isn't BLMC. A merger which leads to another merger. Yeah, in the middle of the 1960s, these were government-inspired mergers, but not within the public sector. These were private sector companies. There was a Labour government, Harold Wilson, and Trade and Industry Secretary was Tony Benn, and he encouraged uh, the companies to merge. And eventually, he encouraged a very small truck manufacturer, I don't know why I'm pointing the back there because it won't be there, um, to take, to essentially manage the whole lot. But what you end up with in 1968 is a range of cars and vehicles like this, but produced in over 60 different factories, yeah. producing only a similar quantity to Ford, who are producing from four <coughs> different factories. So that's 60 different factories with 60 different fixed costs with 60 different management structures, all hating each other and competing with each other against Ford, one management structure, mostly listening to what happens in Detroit, wherever their headquarters is, and four factories in Britain, okay? And this is the wild card. Does anyone know not who these are? But does anyone know who that is? DeLorean. Yeah, very good, John DeLorean. And what, what was the story of John DeLorean? Is he like money laundering or selling drugs? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, he is. But he should be. He, he's better known for being busted, I think, at uh, JFK with $25 million worth of cocaine in his suitcase. Yeah. But before that, the British government had given him, I think, £8 million, eight million pounds to build a car. Yeah, It's the car that features in. This movie has been re-released, I don't know, digitally remastered or something. And they use a DeLorean. It was a dreadful car. DeLorean went to Ireland, nothing to do with Britain, went to the Republic of Ireland and asked them, you know, I want to build a car, a car factory, it's jobs. This is the um, big 1970s. They didn't offer him enough money, so then he went to Panama. Yeah, Panama offered him some money. But then the British government got wind of this and thought, well, we're trying to entice him back. Northern Ireland was um, in the middle of the Civil War, high unemployment, and uh, uh, when you're unemployed, you go out and throw a petrol bomb to the police and the army. So the British government gave DeLorean lots of money to come to Northern Ireland, not the public Ireland. And this factory here is, is on the outskirts of Belfast, was on the outskirts of Belfast, no longer there. And it, it just sucks huge amounts of government money. A, there, a, there was a lesson to learn there, perhaps. It had two doors, one for Protestants and one for Catholics. So one part was a relatively big factory. One part of the factory bordered a Protestant area and one bordered a, a Catholic area and they, they had their own separate, separate ent entrances and they didn't work together very well. Anyway, uh, he, uh, <laughs> at the end of all this, he gets set up by the FBI with a, a, on a drugs deal and gets busted for cocaine. He actually gets off. He gets off for the cocaine deal but, but he says in this interview in time, which is uh, 1981, something like this, 82 in fact, he says, 
Who would buy a second-hand car from me? <laughs> uh, okay, so last but not least, British Lane. So this is where the story ends. There is Tony Benn as trade and industry secretary, encouraging <coughs> Leyland Trucks, a successful truck and tractor manufacturer, to take over B BNC, British um, Motor Company, okay, which was Austin, which was which was a huge amount. Okay, so Austin Morris Walls, the MG Riley Daimler, da da da, uh, lots of car and truck factories. Then came British Leyland. This is actually t Tony Benn and Ben. I'm oh, sorry, I'm shooting someone with my infrared beam. Dennis Healy. Who's Dennis Healy? No one knows who Dennis. No one knows who Dennis Healy is. He was. He was. Well, he, he wasn't Chancellor then. Then, because that was uh, uh, Roy Jenkins, okay, one of the gang of four. But uh, he was Chancellor in the nineteen seventies when this was a government-inspired uh, merger. Okay, no government money, possibly some informal government money, you know, tax incentives, but no direct government money. Th By the time this picture was taken, this Barbara Castle in the background, yeah, who's seen. Uh, made in um, Made in Dagen. Okay, so you'll see who plays Barbara Castle in Made in Dagen? So, uh, but by this time, by the time this picture was taken, the government owned uh, British Labour. And market share, okay? Market share doesn't look good, does it? It's a pretty negative story, isn't it? Okay, and the competition was the main, what British Leyland were tr always trying to do badly was compete with Ford. Does ownership matter? Okay, the American company, okay, four factories as opposed to 60 factories, volume, the, the four factory getting economies of scale, the 60 factories failing. This car here was a direct competitor to this car here, which is the Ford Cortina, Morris 1100. Cost about the same, the base model, but the attractiveness was very, very different. But this was also, we think about the Mini and the Land Rover and various other vehicles, this was also Austin Rover or British, uh, British Motor Company, BMC and then British Leyland's most successful car ever in terms of volume production and profitability for, volume for a volume produced car. But um, it's not a positive story, is it? So output, profits decline, output declines, Massively. This is around the time, this is the government takeover time, okay, so things go badly wrong here. We, ha we are having some exogenous shocks though, aren't we? What exogenous shocks are we having? Oil prices. Oil prices, yeah. yeah. What, when are they? 1973. 1973, yeah. 79. And 79, yeah, the Iranian uh, revolution. Okay, so that has a big impact on motor cars, doesn't it? And suddenly, every now and then, the Mini is in production, the original Mini, not the BMW Mini, until the year 2000. Every now and then, from 1959 to the year 2000, uh, the last one left the Long Bridge plant in the year 2000. Every now and then, when petrol prices increase, the Mini comes back into fashion. But the Mini is never profitable. The Morris 1100, oops, the Morris 1100, which uses some Mini technology, is, but the Mini isn't. Okay, it costs more to produce than it does to sell, uh, than, than you get selling it. Okay, so output per worker, that looks dismal. But then Germany's isn't so much better, is it? So when you're looking at productivity, productivity in cars, productivity in anything is a difficult thing to measure, isn't it? And so we, we talk about total factor productivity, which is an ideal, <coughs> but again, very difficult to calculate, particularly in the car industry, because it's units per producer, yeah? But the units differ hugely from the, what's that? World's cheapest small car. Absolutely, it's the Tartan Hanna, the world's cheapest small car. And this is uh, something else. Um, but if you're measuring productivity between Tartar Industries, who produce a lot of other vehicles as well, and BMW, I suppose, okay, who own Rolls Royce now, though it was a, it's an interesting story how they get the Rolls Royce brand, uh, a story in itself. You're not really comparing like with like, are you? So it's units per worker, okay? BMW versus Tata. Okay, this is back to the BL story. <laughs> Return on sales. Not good. You can see what's happening at the time of nationalisation, yeah? 
Okay? So if it hadn't, if the state hadn't moved in, it wouldn't be there. But was it? How long does BL survive after this, after nationalisation? So we have Sir Michael Edwards, we have privatisation. When BL is privatised, who is it sold to? Does anyone know? Initially. No one knows. Sold to British Aerospace. What else did British Aer Aerospace do? They, make, they do make wings for the Airbus, don't they? But they're mostly involved in defence industry, don't they? Okay, they sell it off to, who do they sell it off to? They sell it off to BMW, yeah, they, sell, they, they, they get a tiny buck for it. Why BMW wants to buy it? Well, that's a story in itself. That's a good story. And, and this, again, cost me, I don't know, cost me more to post than it did to buy. It's a good book. That, I was talking to Ed, and Ed was reading, Ed reads this on the tube, and I suggest you do similarly. But this is another good book to read on tube. Better than the Metro, although you'll read about the Metro in it as well. So, here is Dennis Healy again with Ian Varley, okay? And he replaced, there was a Conservative government in between, led by Edward Heath, who wasn't that much different to the Labour government in terms of bailing out British industries, hence Margaret Thatcher's no U-turn subsequently. And he was trading in industry secretary after Tony Benn. And Benn, this is what we kind of associate with the decline of British volume car production. But it, let me emphasise it is a much more complex story to, to that. There are two sides to problems with a workforce. And one side of that is, is management. It started with motorbikes and McKinsey coming into BSA Triumph in 1964. And we come back to, if you like, consultancy. Why no one told them to streamline production? This, is a, this was an advert, a newspaper advert. And it just doesn't make sense from the 1980s. That, so, and they were producing more cars than this. This isn't even all their production. They still had nearly 60 factories. And it was mad. So they had all these mergers, but they hadn't realised the efficiency gains that you get from mergers. So they've got all these different management teams, all these different factories, all producing small quantities of different vehicles. Different, different vehicles that don't even share components. It's mad. Um, most of them also are rubbish. You do need to ultimately get the product, product right. Okay, so was there an alternative? Okay, could we have, you know, could we have gone for survival of the fittest and just forgot about all these mergers and acquisitions and trying to be American, trying to get economies of scale, trying to, <coughs> trying to get efficiency gains without the costs in terms of regional politics, in terms of, in terms of labour disputes. All of these cars, all of these vehicles here, and there are, there are many more, they are mostly niche market products, but none of these are, well, that's a niche market product, so is the McLaren Mercedes, a bit of a niche market product. Here. I don't know, how much is that? 400,000? It's not in production. It's not in production, it's just come out. It's, it was produced, where was it produced then? By McLaren and working. By McLaren and working, absolutely. So this is very good. But anyway, everything else here, including the Triumph motorcycle, is produced in Britain. Okay. Britain can do it, and Britain exports more than it ever has in terms of vehicles. But it's not, uh, it's not British companies anymore. They're Ford, they're Nissan, they're Toyota, they're a reborn Triumph. Now, the Hinkley Triumph, not sure about that in terms of ownership. Does anyone know? <coughs> it's not the same company um, as the um, Meridian Triumph. It's a completely different company. It's, uh, it's a brand. Um, it might be British owned, but that might be the only one there, okay? So Indian, Japanese, German, well, no, British. The fire is British, isn't it? Yeah. But all the, most of the components are German. So Japanese, Malaysian, Japanese, German. Okay, so have we got time for a, my Top Gear clip? Possibly not. I will try and get it posted on some movies. So come back next week for the textile industry. So what's the name of that book you're holding up? It's a 